our invitation um, uh, to present tonight. And I'm certain we will all learn from him. So myself, Firas Arnaut, I'll be moderating the session. And with me, we have Shwan Hinari and Nicola Evans. And good evening. And from uh, Ortho TV team, we have uh, Ashok uh, Shayam um, tonight. So this session, uh, as usual, we will start with a focused lecture um, at uh, exam, exit exam level, mainly FRCS focused. Uh, we will not go into much deep depth to cover everything, but we'll try to stay exam focused. Um, uh, Mr. Al Awadi has um, prepared excellent presentation, has a big educational value, and, and we're going to all enjoy it uh, tonight. Following the presentation, we will have three MCQ questions we'll put to you, and mainly these to see our all what been listening carefully. Um, we'll test you on this. So please uh, listen to the presentation um, all the way through. Following that, we will take uh, candidates for hot seat uh, session. So if anyone is interested, please uh, express your interest as soon as possible. We already have someone, um, Itwali. So, but if anyone else interested, please express your interest to us as soon as possible. We, hard, we very uh, strongly recommend that you take part. It's worthwhile. We understand how stressful this is for you, and we are here to all support you. So we try to make this inter in session as interactive as possible. We will, there will be a question answer session. So please, if you have any questions, write them either in the chat or raise your hand later on or tell us, let us know. And between myself, uh, Khaled, Chuan, and Nicola, we will arrange an answer for you. If you miss any part of this session, please don't worry at all. It will be recorded and posted on Orthopedic Academy YouTube channel and on Ortho TV. So with that uh, further ado, and before I do that, I just want to a uh, little plug here. Um, I'm just going to say, mention about our courses. So we have um, our a uh, new course, um, trial course, which, which is doing very well at the moment, is the FRCS uh, case-based discussion course. It's a very intimate uh, course. We have only five candidates that we sit with throughout the day, all day, and we go through questions covering all topics of the exam. Um, so you'll be exposed to about 35 exam-specific high-yield questions. And we will give you the ideal answer at the end as well. So we, after each question, we'll tell you the ideal or suggested answer for, it, for the question. So we have a course on the 30th of October and course on the 11th of December. As I said, there are only five places in each course. They go very, very quickly. So if interested, uh, please book through the Orthopedic Academy website. And we have our FRC smoke exam course as well. Next one is 23rd of October. And then we have one on 4th of December, 22nd of January. And these get booked immediately. So they are available on Orthopedic Academy website. And please, if you have any, follow us uh, on this uh, Telegram, Twitter, YouTube, and email us if you have any questions, please. And we'll be very happy to help you. So without further ado, I will leave you with Khalid. Over to you, Khalid, if you could uh, share your screen, please. Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, good evening. Um, I will just start sharing my screen. Today, we are going to talk about um, pediatric fractures, starting with the upper limb. Um, I will start my talk with a supracondylar fracture. Uh, um, as an as of incidence, it's uh, the extension type of supracondylar fracture is the commonest, um, usually between fifty nine to ninety eight percent. Sorry, ninety five to ninety eight percent. Flexion type is less common though, uh, usually in children between five to seven uh, years of age. Equal incidence between male and female, and the usual mechanism is fall uh, on the outstretched hand. Uh, more importantly in the, for the FRCS is how to examine pa pediatric patients, uh, uh, being playful attitude, uh, sitting or kneeling forwards. Um, in the setting of uh, ED, analgesia and splinting is very important. Uh, 
And specifically for the supracondylar fracture, we need to examine them on regular intervals, um, specifically before and after applying the splint. Um, this is Gartland classification, um, which is uh, which has classified them into three types. Type one is undisplaced fracture. Type two is uh, displaced with intact posterior cortex, uh, and type three is completely displaced. Uh, there is another classification that uh, uh, you need to be aware of, which is the Wil uh, Wilkins modified by, uh, modification of Gartlands that classify them into four types. Type one would be the undisplaced fracture. So it's similar to type one with Gartland. Type two uh, was classified to type two A and B. A is with intact posterior cortex and B uh, still with intact posterior cortex, but there is um, angulation and rotation. Type three uh, is again subclassified into A and B. A is posteromedial displacement and B is posterolateral displacement. And type four is uh, displaced on a stable, both in flexion and in extension as well. Um, as for the radiographs, it's important to do an AP view and a lateral view. For the, uh, for the lateral view, as we can see on the left-hand side, sometimes the only finding that uh, someone can see is the uh, on, in an undisplaced fracture is uh, the loosened shadows here which indicate fat pad sign, anterior and posterior. Uh, the presence of obsterior fat pad is highly suggestive of an occult fracture in the elbow, uh, whereas an anterior fat pad sign uh, can occur without a fracture, actually. Um, on the AP view, um, um, we can see the Bowman's angle here, uh, which is uh, the angle between the abaphysis of the lateral condyle and the humeral shaft. The mean of this angle is about 72 degrees. The range is between 64 and, 40 and 81. Um, another, another line that we look at for the, um, on the lateral view is the anterior humeral line. And it's a line along the anterior humerus cortex that extends downward to the capitulum. And usually it intersects um, through the middle third of the capitulum. <coughs> This is useful in determining the adequacy of, uh, of fracture reduction during the surgery. Um, as of the management, we can uh, divide that into management in the emergency department and definitive management. For the emergency department, uh, mainly it's adequate pain relief uh, with an above elbow uh, slab applied in the position of comfort. Uh, for a displaced, completely displaced fracture, um, a splint is better to be near extension to avoid compressing the, the, the neurovascular uh, bundle in front of the elbow. Uh, Gartland uh, classification does help us with, uh, with um, the, determining the line of management that we are going to undertake. Um, I just wanted to quickly, briefly uh, mention, because this is one of the questions, how would you assist the neurovascular status in a, in a child in pain. Very, one should be pay, playful. One should make sure that uh, proper analgesia and splinting has been applied. We uh, apply for the, motor, for the motor examination, the rock, paper, and uh, scissor, and okay approach, where the rock test the median nerve, paper test the radian nerve, scissors test the ulnar nerve, and the okay is for the anterior osseous nerve. Uh, and for the sensory examination, we use the um, autonomous zones. So pulp of the index finger is for the median nerve, pulp of the little finger is for the ulnar nerve, and the dorsum of the first rib space is for the radial nerve. Uh, having done that, it's very important to uh, number one, document that, and number two is to frequently document that, specifically before and after applying a splint. Uh, for most of the centers, uh, I would say that type 1 fractures with a positive fat uh, pad sign uh, would be conservatively treated in an above elbow uh, cast for three to four weeks, elbow flex to 90 degrees with neutral rotation. 
um, uh, for the displaced fractures, uh, one of the questions, well, an important question is the reduction technique. So how would you reduce a type two or a type three fracture? So steps are longitudinal traction. First apply to the forearm to dislodge the fracture uh, and gain the length and correct rotation. Number two is uh, if there is a brachialis sign, which is button holding of the distal uh, fragment through the brachialis, we can apply what we call a, mink, a milking maneuver. So between the thumb and index, we can milk through uh, the skin and try and push the distal fragment back into position. This shouldn't be tried more than two times anyway. Um, supposing that we obtained uh, an acceptable uh, reduction, then uh, most of the centers would go for pinning. Uh, usually we do that using a C arm. Um, whether we do that as a cross technique or a lat or um, through a two K wire two K wires laterally. Recording in progress. Um, is sorry, there is something going on. All, all right. So uh, we use the both guidelines to um, to determine the thickness uh, of the K wires and the both guidelines says two millimeter K wires, although this is not usually possible. Uh, if the closed reduction technique uh, has failed or cannot obtain a proper closed reduction, then we go for an open reduction. Um, we use the latter approach for a posteromedial displacement and a medial approach for a posterolateral displacement. And we use the anterior approach if there is a um, vascular compromise. Uh, now I have this flow chart uh, for the superfundal uh, fracture associated with no pulse. So um, we sort of like divide them into either pink and perfused hand or white and non-perfused hand. For the pink and perfused hand, uh, fraction is, uh, fracture is reduced as per the technique uh, mentioned and tend whether up to your, uh, according to the center you're working for, whether a divergent lateral uh, to pens or uh, crossed K wires, uh, then make sure on the X-rays, this is the most important thing that there is no fracture gap because if there is a fracture gap, it means most probably that the neovascular bundle has uh, become entrapped between the fracture fragments. Uh, if they uh, followed by splinting in about 40 degrees of flexion um, with a neurovascular monitoring and vascular surgery referral early on so that they can make further decision and act fast accordingly. Uh, in the case of a white and non-perfused hand, then uh, reduce the fracture, pen it, uh, and make sure still that there is no fracture gap. If it become pink but pulseless, we can adopt the first uh, the first pathway, which is the pink perfused hand. If not, should be explored by vascular surgeon uh, as well as monitor the compartment. Most probably, there will be uh, compartment decompression following um, a reperfusion procedure. Um, one further point is uh, for the medial side pin, um, there is a, about 8% incidence of ulnar nerve injury uh, due to tethering effect of the, of the K wire in the cubital tunnel. Um, if a medial pin is going to be inserted, in, uh, then a small incision should be put uh, and uh, make sure that we can visualize and protect the nerve as we do that. Uh, to avoid on a nerve injury uh, um, during this uh, process. Um, um, the next fracture that I will, I will talk about is the lateral humeral condylar fracture, uh, which is the second most common fracture um, in children around the elbow. Usually it's a fall from a height or an outswitched hand. And it's, uh, there is a 
the theory of pull off or push off pull off is due to pull of the collateral ligament lateral collateral ligament attached to the um, lateral side push off is by the uh, um, radial head uh, now it's often messed on the radiographs and uh, and an internal oblique elbow radiograph like the one i'm showing here will help us detect uh, occult fracture of the lateral combine. Uh, for the treatment, non-operative treatment can be done uh, with minimal displacement, but uh, close follow-up is important. Articular reduction is the primary goal, so articular surface or articular cartilage reduction, uh, as the complication is relatively common after these fractures. Um, Lateral condylar fracture is still, we need to do an AP lateral and consider internal oblique views, specifically if it's tender around the area and cannot be seen on X-rays. Um, rarely we need a CT scan or MRI, but uh, our program is a very useful uh, tool that the surgeon can apply in, in surgery to make sure that the articular surface is intact and it's even preferred to, M to MRI. This MRI is more is costly and will need sedation or the, the child to be asleep to do it. Um, so for the classification of the lateral condyle, we have two classifications, uh, actually three, but I've, I will concentrate on Milch, which is uh, the first one to classify lateral condyle fracture into type one and type two. Uh, type one was going through the uh, ossification center of the trochlea, so basically stable elbow type two is medial to the ossification center. Uh, the Melch classification doesn't really provide any treatment uh, prognostic uh, guidance, but the VICE one, uh, which was uh, 2009, is now uh, more uh, frequently used, which uh, and is classified into type one, two, and three. One is less than two millimeter with intact articular cartilage type two, is between two uh, to four millimeter with intact articular cartilage. Uh, and type three is more than uh, four millimeter with disrupted articular cartilage. Um, an important point to talk about the lateral condyle is the blood supply. So it, it is supplied by the brachial artery uh, and uh, brachial artery is anterior in the cubital fossa, but the branch that goes to the lateral side uh, on the lateral condyle does come from uh, posteriorly. Um, and uh, for the treatment consideration is the degree of displacement that dictates the management. Uh, most type one fractures with less than two millimeter displacement, there will be intact medial uh, cartilaginous uh, articular surface. So a long arm cast, which is an above elbow cast or a splint with 60 to 90 degrees of uh, flexion due to swelling, uh, but very close follow up. So the first X-ray should be within the first week, um, probably out of the cast and do an internal oblique view as well to make sure that there is no further displacement. Casting can go up to six weeks in some, for, for some cases to make sure that radiologically, uh, and clinically the fracture is healed. For type two fractures, um, um, most of the surgeons will aim to reduce them because those fractures have a very high complication rate, um, either per, percutaneous or open. Percutaneously, uh, the uh, uh, closed reduction is by uh, pushing the fragment anteromedially and using a divergent bin com, uh, configuration, as you can see in this picture, uh, X-rays of uh, this one here, or using a screws. Now, using a screw as, um, provides more compression and early range of motion uh, compared to the pins, um, which are less stiff. Um, a screw will need to be removed if it crosses the vices. Most of type three fractures, uh, those who are which are displaced more than uh, four millimeters or rotated, will need open reduction through a lateral approach. Uh, the interval here is between the triceps and the brachioradialis, which are both supplied by the radial nerve. Um, 
aiming at reducing specifically anteriorly, uh, avoiding posterior dissection. Um, and again, can use either key wires or screws. A screw is uh, preferred because it provides compression and early mobilization. Um, complications of the lateral condyles. So the most common is the lateral overgrowth or the lateral spur. 75% and uh, as well as cubitus uh, valgus. Um, there will be some stiffness and non-union oh, and growth disturbance in tardy ulnar nerve palsy. Um, medial epicondyle fracture, uh, I added that to the presentation because it's quite common. This is the third common elbow injury or fracture, usually in boys 9 to uh, 14 years old. Uh, and it's due to, uh, now becoming more due to athletic injuries. Uh, it can be due to an avulsion, as, uh, as we know that common uh, flexor origin arises from there, as, the, as well as the medial uh, collateral ligament or due to direct trauma, or it, it is associated with elbow dislocation in 50 to 60% of cases. Um, now, it can be incarcerate, incarcerated uh, if it is uh, associated with elbow dislocation. Uh, the incidence of that is about 15%. Uh, one important question is the fusion centers around the elbow, which we can, uh, th there is a monomic there, which is the cry tool. Uh, C is the uh, capitellum, which start at one. R is for the um, radial head, which is three years. And I is the internal of the medial uh, epicondyle, which is five. And T is for the trochlea, seven and O, olecron, and nine and L, lateral um, epicondyle, which is 11. The last to fuse is the medial epicondyle. Um, as stated, it's the origin for the flexor uh, pronator mass as well as the uh, ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, to identify it, we need an AP lateral and axial view like like this view here, because it's postromedial uh, position-wise. Um, treatment usually um, can be non-operative if it's not displaced, five millimeter. Uh, and usually we fix, uh, well, sorry, we keep him in an above elbow cast for one to three weeks and uh, about 90 degrees of flexion, or go for an open reduction internal fixation. Um, the technique for that, it's a medial approach centered on the medial epicondyle itself, uh, visualizing the ulnar nerve. Uh, patient, uh, once we identify the fracture, we can use uh, either K wire or a screw with a washer to compress the fracture. Um, problem with the screw and washer is it's more prominent though, so it will need to be removed. Um, Common complications of medial epicondylar fractures are non-union, uh, nerve injury, injuring the, uh, the ulnar nerve, can be with something between 10 to 16%. Neuropraxia is common. Uh, an important complication is missing an incarcerated uh, medial epicondyle with an elbow uh, dislocation and stiffness uh, following uh, um, operative management. Montigue fracture is next, uh, um, four to 10 years old, radial head dislocation plus proximal ulnar fracture. This is the definition of a Montigue fracture. Uh, it can be associated with plastic deformation of the ulna, uh, classified usually by BADO. Um, so um, type one is anterior ulnar uh, angulation with anterior dislocation of the radial head. And type two is a posterior ulnar angulation with posterior radial head dislocation. Type three is laterals, and type four is associated proximal radius fracture. Uh, for the x ray, again, it's very important to look at both the elbow and the wrist joint and uh, look at the uh, line of the 
axis of the radius, which should be running through the um, lateral uh, condyle of the humerus. So, uh, radiocapitular line is a very is, a, is an important line to look at on the lateral view, um, as well as uh, don't forget to obtain forearm fracture. Treatment non-operative, indicated in DADO type one uh, to three with radial head uh, stable following closed reduction. Uh, Reduction technique itself is traction and radial head that most probably and, and, and almost most of cases continuously reduce um, once the ulnar length is uh, restored. Uh, for a type one uh, bado, elbow flexion is the main reduction maneuver. Uh, following re reduction, type one will be immobilized in 110 degrees of flexion, full supination. Uh, the aim is to tighten the interosseous brain and relax the biceps tendon. Type two should be in full extension because it's posterior angulated. Type three, uh, full extension with vulgus molding of, of the cast. Um, there is an indication for uh, operative uh, pinning or nailing of the ulna, uh, uh, which is type one, Badu tab one, two, three, uh, where the radial head is not stable following the reduction, or the ulna length is not stable, so unable to maintain basically either the ulna or the radial head in uh, in reduced position. Uh, in an acute Badu type four, in open fractures in an older patients, uh, or if like adults should be uh, done. Um, Technique-wise, usually annular ligament reconstruction is almost never required, as again, once open reduction of the uh, ulna is obtained, usually the radial head is reduced um, um, as well. Uh, next is fractured radius and ulna. And Fractured radius and ulna is about 40% of all pediatric fractures. Males are more than females. Uh, usually it's falls due to falls from a height, sporting or playground falls. And it is associated with other injuries like floating elbow in 15% uh, of the cases, uh, supracondylar fracture. Uh, neuro neurologic injuries, median nerve, and about 1% of, of the injuries. Uh, one of the important exam questions for the FRCS is the muscles uh, causing the deformity. Uh, so the biceps and supinator act on the proximal fragment to flex it and supinate it, while the pronator teres and the pronator quadratus work on the distal fragment to pronate it. And the brachyradialis again act at the distal fragment to dorsiflex and radially deviate it. So for the distal fragment, there will be pronation, dorsal flexion, and radial deviation, while proximal fragment will be in a flexed subinated position. Um, X-rays, we do AP and lateral forearm uh, X-rays uh, to visualize both the radius and ulna. Uh, sometimes you can see only single bone fracture but that will mean that the, there will be plastic deformation of the other bone because the radius and ulna are one unit. It's like one joint. And there is no if there is no fracture but bowing, this would be suggestive of uh, a plastic deformation. Uh, another question that can be asked either in MCQs or for vivas is the rotation of malalignment or X-ray. So basically the bicepital tuberosity should align to 180 degrees from the radial styloid uh, on the AP. And um, uh, the ulnar styloid, the coronoid, should be 180 degrees on the lateral. Uh, there should be some matching diameter of the proximal and distal fragment and matching the thickness of cortices, proximal and distal fragment. Classification can either uh, classify it as an incomplete or complete fracture. So green stick fractures, torus, um, plastic deformation, um, or we can classify it by the position of the fracture, proximal, middle, or distal thirds. 
uh, as well as by the direction of the deformity, so abix volar or abix dorsal button. Um, sorry. Um, treatment, close reduction and casting. Uh, important to know the tolerances are accepted, uh, accepted pediatric for arm malalignment. So uh, that depends on the age. So uh, up to 10 years, we can accept an angle, an angulation of less than 15 degrees and a rotation of about 45 degrees or up to 45 degrees and a dinette opposition, which is shortening of the two fragments of about centimeter or less. If the child is above 10 years, for, so from 10 years and above, the angle will be 10 degrees or less and the rotation will be 30 degrees or less with no opposition or shortening. Um, once the child reaches to uh, almost near to the growth, uh, um, uh, sorry, to skeletal maturity, uh, around less than two years from skeletal maturity, so no rotation or angulation should be accepted, zero degrees and no bionic opposition. So the number would be 10 years. Anything below, you can accept 15 degrees of angulation, 45 degrees, of rotation or less, and one centimeter, less than one centimeter of shortening, uh, 10 years or above, then the angulation is less than 10 degrees and the rotation is less than 30 degrees. Bionic position is uh, non zero. If there is less than two years of growth remaining, then don't accept any deformity and proceed to fix them um, or close reduce them. Usually, close reduction is done under analgesia. Um, uh, for plastic deformation, it's a three-point bending to uh, counteract the bending deformity. Uh, for green stick fractures, it's attraction and direct pressure. Uh, again, a three-point bending. Um, basically, if it's a volar angle, then we fix them in pronation. If it's a dorsal angle, then we fix them in subination. Um, so basically traction and reverse the deformity and use three point uh, technique. The casting will maintain the reduction. Uh, again, three point molding and interosseous mold, uh, membrane molding. Uh, so avoid loss of reduction. Keep a close eye and do X-rays. Uh, very important to keep a close eye on our compartment syndrome. If there is excessive swelling, then you might think of bivalving um, the cost to avoid the, uh, this. If the, if the reduction technique after closed reduction uh, was outside the acceptable uh, degrees of rotation, angulation, and shortening uh, just mentioned earlier, then we can consider either bare continuous spinning. Uh, or open reduction internal fixation, uh, specifically for children above 13 years uh, or badly severely displaced fracture, which is a relative uh, indication. Um, uh, now for the uh, distal radial or distal wrist fracture. Uh, sorry. So this terrain is fraction, Galeazi fracture. This is about 31% of the fractures. The peak incidence of ages 11 to 12 years in girls and 13 to 14 years in boys. Um, males more than females. So the ratio is 1.5. Physis uh, involved about one third of the patients with distal radius fracture. Pain, swelling, and tenderness, uh, spontaneous movement is reduced. Uh, very common with foul on an outstretched hand. AP and lateral radiographs, uh, very rarely that we need a CT scan to detect interarticular extension. Um, uh, the first type of fractures is the torus or the buccal fractures. Uh, this is my drawing here. So torus is basically a uh, unicortical indent or buckling of the cortex. Uh, this is to compare to the green stick fracture, which is a complete fracture on one cortex and plastic deformation or bending on the other. 
Um, Torah structures are usually stable. We can trade that in a splint, uh, removable splint, which is uh, which is important to reduce the healthcare cost and the burden on the family. Uh, usually, they recover function and return to sports earlier with removable uh, removable splints. Um, for green stack fractures, um, there is sorry. Uh, there is a combined total uh, cortical disruption with plastic deformation, as per the previous drawing. Um, if it's only pure bending forces, then the radius and ulna will break at the same level. If there is rotational uh, forces, then they will break at, uh, at different levels. Um, uh, when it's the same level, so when you reduce it, you reduce it using the three-point uh, fixation uh, principle in a uniplanar reduction. If it's different levels, then uh, consider the direction of the apex. If it's apex vola, then uh, reduce in pronation. If it's apex dorsal, then you reduce in supination. Um, Again, there is a debate whether to complete it or not. Those who are with completing the fracture, it's uh, for proper alignment and uh, better color formation and fracture. And, and the drawback is less fracture stability. How are we doing time-wise? Are we doing well, I think? Um, metaphysical yeah, fracture. Okay, yeah, we're okay, yeah, Khaled. I think you only got a uh, few more slides to go anyway, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, three fine. slides. Um, okay, we're fine, oh, perfect. We, we, we all yeah, started. trying to keep the time. Uh, so, metaphysical fractures uh, are common. Alma, Alma is commonly fractured as well. There will be clinical and radiographic deformity. Uh, studied, studies have definitely shown that remodeling potential. Uh, is good with, with both the radius and ulna, and uh, no reduction has been attempted. Even with no reduction has been attempted, that's 2003 by Dew and Crawford, 2012, and even Blount in 1967. Bionet opposition can be accepted and patient uh, age younger, usually than 10 years. Uh, in the reduction, uh, we mold to maintain uh, and maintain in a below elbow cost uh, we use the principles of uh, the cost index, uh, which is by chess. For those who have uh, are not familiar with that, so the cost index is defined as the measurement of the internal cost uh, width on the lateral view and the internal cost width in the AP view. Uh, and this is expressed as a ratio, uh, and it would be uh, okay as long as it's below one. Um, and uh, as, the, as the cuff become more circular, so the lateral diameter approach uh, approaches that uh, the AP diameter and the cuff index will be closer to one. So it's better as, uh, as long as less than one, it's, it's good. Um, there is good evidence that minimally displaced fracture in the metaphysis treated by a simple splint similar to the buccal fracture uh, still gives good functional um, and uh, healing. So next, we talk about the metaphysial fracture. Uh, when the fracture is not within the acceptable alignment with the closed reduction, and again, the acceptable alignment depends on age. So those who are below 10 years, we accept less than one centimeter, 15 to 20 degrees of angulation. Now we are in the metaphysial area and a mass rotation of less than 40, 45 degrees with a dorsal angulation of about 30 degrees. For those who are above 10 years, uh, bionet opposition is not acceptable. Angulation should be 10 degrees and specifically distal radius and ulna, it should be less than 20 degrees. And uh, for the mass rotation, it's about 30 degrees. So the complication rates uh, for the initial measurement uh, with pin fixation appeared to be uh, related to mainly to the potential loss of reduction, uh, not the pinning. And there has been no change in the long-term outcome. 
so that's why there is mounting evidence that uh, simpler or simplified treatment of the distal radius fracture. And currently, we are running the U uh, the, in the UK the Craft trial. Uh, I, I know it's it's early, but there is some indication from early evidence that uh, better results actually with with an, uh, on the non-operative arm. But we are still running the trial, so don't say this. <laughs> Um, now for the physeal fracture to go through its distal radius vices, 90% of the growth happens in it. Uh, it has got a very good significant remodeling potential. Uh, uh, pure distal ulnar physeal injuries are much less common and uh, it's most, most often associated with metaphyseal fractures uh, of the distal radius. One third of pediatric fractures uh, occur in the distal radial uh, physis, usually sultan and type 1, can be sultan and type 2. You will know that due to normal x-rays and localized tenderness in the distal radius. Um, half of, of those distal radial physial uh, injuries will be associated with, ul with ulnar styloid and uh, metaphyseal injury of the ulna as well. Um, if it's non-displaced, then below elbow splint, cost for about three, four weeks. Uh, if it is displaced, then uh, the, the uh, physeal fracture, then close reduction, uh, but this can cause risk of physeal arrest. Uh, even if there is residual angulation greater than 20 degrees, this will normalize subsequently uh, as Bear Freiberg in 1979. So the recommendation for reduction uh, is uh, according to uh, to the previous tolerances as we discussed it. Um, but basically avoid repeat repeated forcible and, and late attempts. Physeal arrest may still occur even uh, if it has been, because there has been enough compressive forces uh, in the injury, specifically in, in Sotan has type one. Uh, the, uh, there is a very good and great potential of remodeling age at the time of the fracture has significant impact on the outcome. Uh, the closure of the distal radius uh, plate occurs over a very short time, so less than one year. So it's got something like a triplane fracture of the distal radius that, that's rare, but uh, maybe worth mentioning. And I think that's that's the last slide, so we are doing fine. So Galeazzi fracture, uh, the force here runs through the ulna side of the distal forearm with uh, fracture of the distal radius and dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. Uh, it's, it's frequently missed uh, on the initial assessment, but uh, still there is good outcomes. Uh, for, close, for close treatment, uh, even when recognized late, as by the paper by April 2008. Um, if we reduce the fracture of the radius accurately, then we expect the forearm to uh, usually in, to fall into supination and reduction of the torn articular disc and ligaments, uh, which will allow healing uh, in their approximate position. The triangular fibro cartilage uh, is attached to the ulnar styloid and it can cause uh, ulnar styloid avulsion. So if you see that, you expect that the TFCC has been injured uh, with the distal radial uh, difficile injury. Uh, styloid non-union uh, occurs, but this shouldn't be uh, given a problem functionally, except if the patient has ongoing Unsided wrist pain after the fracture of the distal radius, uh, then uh, work up uh, as a TFCC uh, tear. Um, I think that's it for this part. And uh, back to you, Firas. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Khalid, for any this. questions um, from the audience. Yeah. Was very very comprehensive and focused lecture. Very thank you very much. Uh, for the interest of time, we will try to move on as quick as we can. There is one question came in across, which is very sensible question about what's the time uh, span between a fracture and manipulation? How long can you 
wait for before you, you know. Well, I'm not sure. As, are we talking about the supracondylar fracture? No, uh, generally with the physial fracture, with the physial fracture. The sooner uh, the better, as, as yeah, indicated what, in this slide. When, when is it? What is the timeline when you say manipulation now is going to cause more damage than uh, good? Manipulation if it's delayed. Yeah, what, what is the time like, frame for like that? Some, if it comes, I would say something more than a week. More than a week, yeah. And is yeah. that evidence or is it uh, experience-based? It's or? experience rather than yeah. evidence. Uh, having gone through them, preparing the slides, I didn't really see any sort of like time. Every, I mean, mo most of what's written in the literature says uh, chronic or delayed um, manipulation. But we know, don't know exactly the time span. For not not, that, not that days, exactly. not not like weeks. I couldn't see it, at least when I was uh, yeah. preparing the, the lecture. Could I suggest that a test yeah. would be to take the back slab off and uh, palpate the arm? If it's mobile and painful, then it's easy to put back into place. If it's already solid. Yeah. I think that's sensible. If it's still painful, it means yeah. it's still mobile. And I yet. think it depends on the age of the child as well, isn't it? child of two years old might heal within a week yeah. or two. A child of, you know, 10, 12, take longer. So I think that's also another factor here. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably why there is no hard evidence behind this, because I think it's quite complicated too. Not that I could see. Uh, yeah. If anyone else has uh, more sort of like literature, literature experience, uh, let us know. So I think probably for the exam uh, answer, like uh, Schwan said, it'll probably be more as on a clinical grounds. There is no exact number, but maybe on a clinical ground and clinical assessment of whether there is a, an established healing process has started uh, or not. Uh, I think that's sensible. If, if yeah. you remove the cost, um, the patient is still tender, should assume that is... Um, mobile still or you can try and reduce it yeah so there was one more question the, sorry in yeah. the exam in the exam if you're asked this is a week late and you, you are what you what would you do um you you will assess the patient establish if there's any pain or uh, discomfort with uh, movement um but you will discuss this with a senior pediatric colleague. Um, yeah. The reason why is the pediatric colleague is the one that's going to deal with the complication later on. So yeah. you want to get their advice on what to do. And then they say, okay, you're the pediatric colleague, what would you do? And then you can decide whether you want to leave it or go for do an osteotomy at a later stage or a corrective uh, thing. It depends on what the injury is in terms of growth plate or extra growth plate injury. I think that's sensible fun because, uh, again, this is for the FRCS. So for the FRCS, I would do exactly like what you said. I will discuss that with the pediatric colleagues before doing or going further and then decide accordingly. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. And one more question uh, from Ajay. He's asked, which nerve injured in PL? I think, I presume that posterior lateral and posteromedial supracondylar humerus fractures so um i will so the nerve the nerve injured so for the flexion type of, of supracondylar fracture it's usually ulnar nerve now for the extension type it's usually the median nerve and commonly or most commonly is the anterior anti osseous and the, the cause or why is because the dorsal part of the median nerve is very nearby the proximal fragment and the fascicles of the anterior interosseous nerve specifically is more posterior. So they will be sort of like directly impacted by that. As well as the anterior interosseous nerve is fixed while it crosses through the interosseous membrane. So there are two factors, uh, and both of them are anatomical. The fact that the median nerve is with the neurovascular bundle and uh, the fact that the anterior interosseous fascicles specifically are more closer to the fracture and that the anterior interosseous nerve itself is fixed while it crosses the interosseous membrane. So that's a good question, I think. But usually these are temporary and usually they recover in six months. So usually neuropraxias. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Uh, yeah.
Sorry, I'm, everything you've said, I'm not, uh, I agree with. Um, but I'm just I'm going to answer Matwali's second question. He was asking about the radius and physio injuries. Um, you have to remember that the ability for the bone to remodel is based on the range of motion and the direction of motion of the joint. So the majority of physio injuries are dorsally angulated and therefore there's a lot of movement in the wrist. So if you've missed the boat on a correction, we, uh, as we've described, it's not necessarily the end of uh, or a bad outcome for this child. No. Because no, there is still a, quite a significant correction left. Even if the child is close to uh, uh, fusion, there will still be a, quite a significant corrected, correction yeah. left. And then once he's, they've finished growing, let's say it's a 15-year-old, they've got a year, maybe two years left in their growth or a 14-year-old year or two years left wait and see and then you can do an osteotomy once once the correction uh, has, has stopped once the remodeling has stopped yeah i think shuan kanata in 2003 has exactly written what you said is on one of these last points it's a, the greatest potential for remodeling is in the distal radius and age and time of fracture has a significant impact on the outcome so maybe this this um, this paper here, the Kanata paper from two thousand three, might uh, give some more uh, shed some more light on on this point as well. Yeah, that's a good idea. I think it's a paper to have a look at, and it might it might give a little bit of uh, backing and support for answers um, with this regard. I think that's probably definitely a level eight kind of uh, yeah question and answer. So um, that's a good one. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think um, I like your, the cry toll um, yeah. mnemonic. I think that's, that's very useful as well uh, for the closure of the ossification centers or of the elbow. I think uh, you guys can have a look at that as well again later on when you view the lectures. Um, fine. For interest of time, we'll move on. Um, so, next part of the of this is the questions. Can you I will see? stop sharing? It, yeah, that's fine. Uh, can you see, guys, the poll? No. Okay. How about now? Great. So, guys, uh, for all those uh, watching, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so, for all of you watching, I'm very sorry that um, the people who are live streaming are unable to see this this poll, uh, this poll, the questions. Um, there are three MCQs. Uh, please, everyone who's attending, please attempt to answer. Uh, uh, this the answers will be anonymized, so we cannot identify who said what. But we encourage you all to read through these questions and to go through the answers and do your best. These are from the lecture, they are very relevant. And uh, Mr. Alawadi will go through the answers at the end. So please, uh, everyone answer please, yeah? We only have uh, three minutes uh, for this section. So everyone answer the attempt and answer, it's really anonymized, so you're not gonna be identified, don't worry. But it's a good practice, uh, to consolidate your knowledge. Uh, and, and then we will go through the questions and the answer at the end. Um, if you don't mind, Khaled, when you discuss the answers at the end, if you could just go through the question itself, because uh, for the people who are streaming, they cannot see the question. Yes, of course, yeah. Thank yeah. you. So we'll just give you guys another couple of minutes. Please, everyone attempt to answer, please. And following this, there will be the hot seat viva practice. That's that uh, the hot seat uh, practice is not recorded. Um, if uh, uh, it will be, um, it will be edited out of the of the of the uh, of the video. So please, everyone who is here, please try to answer these questions, um, and we'll go through the answers in a minute. Um,
Fine, so the three minutes are over now. Um, I'm going to end the poll. Uh, guys, uh, if anyone is trying to answer, please um, just finish your answers quickly. I'll give you an extra 10 seconds. That's lovely. So I'll, I'll end the poll now. So, okay, Khalid, if you would like to go through the questions uh, with us, please. So, All right. So the first one was seven years old who fell uh, on a slide, fell off a slide. There is a fracture of uh, the distal humerus. Uh, this fracture is now will be or can be associated with a gum stock deformity. Um, because of one of the three options. Just let me get the options in front of me again. So the first option was Gartland type 2 with a lateral cortex impaction uh, or Gartland type 2 with a posterolateral lateral displacement of the fragment or Gartland type 3 with lateral interarticular involvement or Gartland type 2 with impaction of the medial cortex or Gartland type 2 with a posteromedial displacement of the fragment. Um, and the right answer for this one is the medial cortex impaction. And uh, fractures with medial cortex impaction tend to end up uh, in a male united position and uh, a gun stock deformity. Uh, and that's why it's recommended that for the um, for most of those injuries to get x-rays of both hands, in theater and make sure that you correct the Bowman's angle to be similar on each side. Uh, and usually it's a very small union that causes this uh, risk. For question, sorry, um, question number. So this was a hard question, this last one. It is, I think. <laughs> Only 27% uh, answered correctly. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was, but uh, it's very important to look at the AP view, make sure that there is no medial cortex comminution and impaction. Yeah. And if so, in your surgery, you need to look and measure the Bowman's angle and, and try and uh, sort of copy the other side to avoid the various deformity. Uh, that's how you avoid it. And it's due to various malunion. Um, the most common, the second question is, the most common complication of a lateral condylar fracture, well, is it cubitus varus? Ulnar nerve palsy, which is tardy ulnar nerve palsy, osteo necrosis, cubitus vulgus, or lateral spare formation. The answer would be the lateral spare formation, uh, which is the lateral protuberance. Uh, that happens in about half of the cases. It's It has no functional disability and no surgical treatment is required. Uh, it was one question this past uh, time that uh, someone with a tardy ulnar nerve palsy, uh, again, it's, it's not the commonest, the commonest actually, the lateral spare formation. I think that's a wonderful question. I love this one, uh, Khalid, because I think it, it displays very important skill in MCQs. Yeah. It's yeah. not the, more, the one you hear a lot more about. Yeah. yeah. Or the most significant. Read the question. Is the most common, and the most common comes sometimes could be the most minor of, of the complications, not the one you all hear about and we have to deal with. Yeah. So please, guys, this is a good example of, of how to actually read the question and just ask you what's most common, not the most serious or most... Yeah, um, and specifically for this exam, because you really need to do it fast. Yes, um, I think as, as, that's why some people come out of the MCQs component of the exam thinking they've done well, but they actually have not really answered the correct question. But so only 18%, yeah. only 18 were focused on this one. 18, 18, 18. 18, 18 yeah. One percent oh, answered, yeah. answered. Most answers were about cubitus uh, valgus. Mm. Um, and I, I didn't think it was that difficult, really, for us when I was. And, and nerve. 
But it, it, um, it's not a trick question. It's, it's just no, a, at all, uh, not at all. It's just well, how it goes. I thought it's, it's been discussed actually before, but anyway. Yeah. Um, Third question, please. Uh, is the elastic nails for the forearm? So yeah. whether number A is radial entry at the fourth and fifth extensor compartment, B, diameter of the nail for each bone is 30 to 50 percent of diameter of medullary canal. Uh, proximal entry on the ulna or at the ulna uh, nerve, the ulna nerve needs to be visualized. Indications, failed closed reduction, refracture, open fracture, epsilateral humeral fracture, unstable radio ulnar uh, dislocation, or E, all of the above. So the answer is a D, actually, where the indications are all the right thing. The radial entry is not at the fourth and fifth extensor. You can uh, either enter the radius, uh, the, fir uh, the first and second compartment between them, which is APL and ECRL tendons, or the second and third compartment ECRP. That's if you are going dorsally. But if you are going laterally, it's about two, two, um, uh, two centimeter proximal to the distal radial abaphysis. Uh, uh, that's on the radius. Um, the diameter of the nail, I uh, put that one because they ask about the femur. It's about 30 to 40 percent. But for the radius and ulna, it's different. Usually we use only one. So it's about two thirds of the canal, 60 to 80 percent. Uh, because actually, both, both bones work as one bone with the interosseous membrane between them. So, um, so that one was wrong. It's not 30 to 50, it's about two thirds or 60. To 80 percent, uh, and then the there is a proximal entry of the ulna. The ulna nerve doesn't need to be visualized. You go and you avoid the uh, olecranon uh, apophysis, and you will be away from the ulna nerve. Indications are all right: failed close reduction, refracture, open fracture, epsilateral humerus fracture, unstable radio ulna dislocation. Uh, we use plates if it's severely comminuted um, um, fracture or length unstable uh, fracture. All of the above is not because it's only one. Brilliant. Only 9% for this one, uh, Khaled. Okay. And, 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 uh, Do you think it's, it's that difficult? I think, uh, to be honest, I don't think it's difficult, but when people... Uh, and I think it's a very good to demonstrate another skill in MCQ. I think that's the time stress. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think by what you was in the exam as well, in the exam, you get one and I have or maximum one and a half minute per question. Yes. Yes. So, um, but when people see all the above, they mm -hmm. think that's the answer. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of the time it is, but not every time. Um, but, but that's why I, I, I specifically for this one yeah. I, I went through all all of them because yeah. you need to know the technique even even for you if you're doing a trauma list you need to know Absolutely. where are you going and distally where are you going and proximally do I need to visualize down and have medical legally no as long as you are away from the offices um, uh, uh, it's the indication that you need to get them right when to use the plate severe comminution severe displacement. Basically, length on a stable fractures. Otherwise, Thanks. it's it's both the plates and and the elastic nails do the same, but the operative time for the elastic nails is much shorter. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Harid. Uh, wonderful questions. Now we'll move on for uh, interest of time. We uh, to immediately to the viva questions. So um, recording stopped. Thank you very much. Um, so Ashwan ready with the question and our, or Nicola, Nikki, Nikki maybe can start first question, please. Uh, if you're ready, please. And we got the first yeah. candidate. Uh, Metwelli is uh, the first uh, candidate um, this evening. Um, so we, we have three questions. We've got Metwelli. Uh, we got uh, um, Mahmoud Asif. We got Asif and we got um Ajay. So um so Metwali, are you with us? Can you um yes I'm here. Brilliant. So um would you like to start? Yeah. Five yes. minutes. You got five minutes. Okay. Hi Metwali. Um yes, hi. So here's your case. So we've got a 13-year-old boy who's injured his left hand when he was playing cricket at school. 
So can you tell me what you see and then talk me through your assessment? No, this is a clinical photograph of the right hand, of left hand of the child showing angel nail bed of the middle finger. I need to take history regarding the mechanism of injuries and hand dominance. And the, I, will, I, will, and I will assess the neurovascular status of the limb and I will ask for an exercise of the finger in the EB and lateral, uh, lateral view. Okay. Looks as the nail bed is avulsed from the uh, the nail plate is avulsed from the proximal uh, nail fold. It's, I suspect I suspect uh, nail bed injury and say more fracture. I will ask an X-ray, EB, and lateral uh, radiograph of the finger. Okay, all right, good. So here's your X-ray. We've already got a lateral, but uh, tell me what you think about this. Yeah, this is. Uh, Sultan has type uh, one. Sultan has type one injury of the uh, distal pharynx with this dorsal displacement and uh, angulation. Uh, this is an open injury. I will consent the patient. This needs uh, operative intervention to do uh, under anesthesia. I will do debridement of the of the of the wound and I, I, I will remove the nail uh, reduce the nail blade and try to repair the um, reduce the blade the nail blade to the into the nail fold and i try to extract all the nail blade nail bed is entrapped inside the fracture site i will extract it and possibly repair okay um is there anything else that you want to give this child bear in mind what you've told me yeah on, on, on an admission the patient I will give, what can I give the patient painkiller and I will explain the, I put dressing and, uh, and I give the patient an, an, uh, an, uh, IV antibiotics and I check the immunization status regarding the tetanus observation uh, according to the immunization status. Okay. All right. So you take it to theater <clears throat> um, and you reduce the fracture, but you find it's unstable. What can you do next? If, if the, Almost always, if it is unstable, I will do uh, intramedullary wire through the proximal. I will pin it from the tip of the finger by a small key wire. I can also cross the, the distal interferential joint if, if my fixation is not secure. Okay. And when will you remove the wire? I, I will remove the wires after three weeks. Okay. All right. And what can you tell? the um, parents of this child about long-term? The, the, the possibility of, this is an open fracture, this possibility of uh, infection, this possibility of nail, nail blade deformity later on, or uh, gross arrest. Okay. All right. And um, you mentioned the word Seymour fracture. Can you tell me Exactly what happens in a Seymour fracture? Seymour fracture is it, uh, this is a physical injury of the terminal pharynx with injury of the nail of the nail nail matrix and the entrapment as the, as the fracture site with displacement of the proximal nail blade from the nail fold. Okay. All right. And the patient has got a mallet finger deformity. Um, can you uh, tell me about the extensor tendon in this particular injury? The terminal slip of the extensor tendon is attached to the epiphysis, to the epiphysis proximal to the site of the fracture. It's over now. Time is over. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Matwali, how do you think you did? I think I answered all the questions, but I was not organized in my approach to the case um i think you did i think you did okay um i guess i mean you picked it was a seymour fracture from the first photograph so i was happy with that um <clears throat> and you were able to explain to me about the mallet deformity the only thing i'm going to pick you up on is you told me it was an open fracture but you didn't say antibiotics i had to prompt you for it so all I'd say is remember when you're, whenever you say open fracture in your head, a little alarm bell should go off. And you said tetanus, check tetanus status and antibiotics. So 
just remember to say antibiotics at the front, but the rest of your description and your management plan and your consent, from my point of view, was okay. All right, so just bear that in mind when you see an open fracture. Okay, anyone else got feedback? I think I, from my point of view, um, I like that uh, you said it's Seymour fracture from first few seconds of the answer. You know, cut the chase and go straight to the um, core of this question rather than, yeah, I think I like mm. that. Yeah. And I would encourage everyone to do it. If you know what's going on, just say it. Yeah, yeah. because if, you, if you're wrong, the examiner will bring you back. But if you put it out there, then you can just move yeah. straight on like like I was able to. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So um, thank you, Vitwali. Well done. That's great. Good to see you. Good. Now we'll move on to the next candidate. Uh, we've had Asif. Asif, can you? Um... Hi. Great. Hi, Asif. So uh, Shwan is your examiner. Yeah. If you could, uh, Shwan, please. Um, again, Asif, you have five, five minutes as usual. Um, so here you go. Time started. Hi, Asif. How are you doing? Your uh, consultant's on call and your registrar calls you to say that uh, he's got this uh, child in the emergency department. So what would you like you know, What would you like to do? Yeah. Uh, so this is a radiograph of a skeletally mature patient's uh, uh, lateral view of the elbow. It shows there is a fracture of the proximal third of the ulna with apex posteriorly. Uh, and there is another fracture uh, which is... Uh, nearly undisplaced of the proximal one-third of the uh, radius as well. It looked like it's a Montegia variant. Uh, as so I will take the history from the patient, uh, the age of the patient, hand dominance, uh, and the mechanism of injury, his uh, fasting level, and look, uh, make sure that this is an isolated injury. Uh, look for the arm circumferentially and record uh, the distal neurovascular status of the patient uh, and make sure that there is no compartment syndrome. Uh, in the accident and emergency, I will give him the pain relief, apply the back slab and get another x-ray and, uh, you know, record all these findings again, particularly the distal neurovascular status. Okay. This need... Yeah. Um, so... You've you've got him in a nice splint. Distal neurovascular status is okay. Um, fast had nothing to eat all day. He's in fact starving. It's eight p.m. What are you going to do? So uh, at the convenient time, uh, uh, I need to take him to theater to uh, reduce it. Uh, uh, it's a slightly unusual fracture because radial head is not subluxated. Anyhow, under the image intensifier, I will make sure that the radial head is in place. And uh, if it comes back nicely, I can uh, I can give him a splint. But I know that these are unstable injuries. What splint? What splint would you use? I will use a uh, all around plaster, but I will split it at the end. Uh, having said that, I know that these are unstable injuries. At any point, if I feel that it is not a stable fracture, or the reduction. What, oh, sorry, not, what do you mean by unstable injury? Meaning that it is more prone to, uh, I mean, if it's if the ulna is not nicely reduced, it can lead to subluxation of the radius. So in okay. the paper, I have to make sure that it is not nicely aligned. If it is not okay. good reduction. So you got nicely aligned. Would you accept that? I will accept it. But what I have to follow it. Put it in? What position are you going to put it in in the x-ray? So it will be in supination, actually 90 degree in supination. 90 degree flexion. You're going to hold that fracture with 90 degrees flexion? So having said that, I know that it is an unstable injury and we fix it most of the time with either trans nail or uh, sometimes even with a plate if the reduction is not absolutely anatomical. Okay. So you plan to plate this. Um, how are you going to go about doing this? So I will open it because the ulna is a subcutaneous bone. I will mm -hmm. give an incision on the on the posterior surface, on the posterior border of the ulna, and uh, uh, visualize the fracture. And under vision, uh, I will fix it with the three screws proximally and three screws distally. But the key is the accurate reduction and stable fixation, so that healing can take place by 
primary union. Okay. So the um, the registrar, um, wh while you're busy trying to put a plate on the back of this, shows you this picture and says, what are you going to do now? So uh, I'm aware of that uh, we, all, we should check the, uh, the wrist as well for any tenderness. And I can see that uh, this is not the true lateral view, but I'm concerned about the How can you, this video is asleep. Point. How can you test for tenderness? So uh, we can do in the accident in emergency and uh, okay, we need so to you, approve. You saw this actually in accident emergency? No, I haven't seen it in the ED. Okay. I should have. Okay. So what, what do you see on this x-ray? Anything concerning? Uh, so I can see that there is a subluxation uh, of the distal radial nerve joint. Mm. And? Uh, and there is posterior, uh, apex posterior angulation of the proximal ulna, and there is a undisplaced fracture of Are the you sure that's apex posterior? Okay, time's over. Five minutes. Okay. All right. How do you think you did? Uh, I should have gone for the wrist at the beginning in the ED. Yeah, you should have gone for both view x-rays on the... Uh, yeah, yeah, that was limited yeah. view, not the proper view. Yeah, no, no, you didn't ask for two views. You didn't ask for an orthogonal view. Maybe I misheard you, but you you ran with the one x-ray I showed you and didn't ask for a further view. If you asked me for a further view, I would refuse to give it to you for a while, just for fun. Yeah. Um, and then uh, show you this x-ray. Uh, interoperatively and say, oh, the the uh, the, ex the other X-ray was the wrong X-ray shown, or something like that. Okay, so the yeah. but that was my little twist in the game. If you were doing really really well, there was something else behind what I was going to do. Um, but you didn't ask for an AP and a lateral, and you told me this is uh, apex posterior. Is that an apex posterior on this view? That's an AP. The other one was a lateral view. Yeah. Yes. Yeah? So is that an apex posterior? Uh, I can't comment if it's not no, the lateral. It's, it's not. No, you need to see both views, isn't that right? So yeah. just bear with me. The problem is I can't put both views up at the same time. So that's posterior. Yeah. That's the lateral, that's the thing. So it's actually mostly uh, apex uh, lateral. So it's a post apex posterior lateral. Hmm. Okay, and that's an unusual presentation, isn't that right? Combination yep. of the two. What's, what, el what else is more unusual? Yeah, do you see that? Is the radial neck Salter Harris 2 of the radial head. Next. Yeah, Re Salter Harris 2 yeah, of the radial head, two. both plate injury. Okay, so um, otherwise quite well. I'm actually, you really did run with it really well. I'm just being very uh, harsh on you because you don't need to fall down because you fail to ask for a further view. Always ask for a further view. Forearm fractures always check with the joint above and below, even though we know it's a montasia. Make sure you're not missing a segmental fracture below. And I have a picture of a young lady who has a segmental fracture and a montasia with a problem at the distal wrist as well. Um, this is not the case. So just be conscious that you're, you're shown a forearm fracture, X-fracture. So you're shown a for forearm fracture. You did not ask for complete views. You accept what you saw and ran with it, okay? Otherwise, presuming this was a simple monetary yeah, sure. fracture, Thank you. Thank you the, right, the radial head didn't look as if it was completely sublux, but I would argue that this is an unstable injury and does require primary fixation. Sorry, wrong way. <coughs> uh, requires primary fixation uh, to prevent further problems. Um, guys, please don't revert to your normal behavior, okay? Just because you put in a, normally a forearm fracture in a, in a neutral position and elbow, think for a moment, what is the deforming forces on this? You've got the triceps pulling on this and you're trying to push against the triceps with nothing connected to it. You're just going to continue maintaining uh, apex volar, I'm sorry, apex dorsal 
uh, ulnar deviate problem. The position to put this in is actually in a straight arm cast. And this is why it's not a good idea to use this uh, to put this, this fracture configuration with off ended slash uh, completely strip periosteum in a cast. You should have recognized that this is unstable. Okay. Thank you very much, Juan. Thank you, Asif, uh, uh, for coming forward. That's, that's very useful. Um, I'm sure to you for the exams, um, the very, very common exam scenario here. So the third question is from Shitan. Shitan, are you able to share your uh, screen, please? And the sec third candidate with us is Ajay. Ajay, can you sp um, unmute yourself, please? Yeah, then thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, Shitan, if you could put it, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Hi, Ajay. Uh, here you go. Hi. Five minutes, Ajay, yeah? Yeah. Thank Hi, you. Ajay. You are in uh, trauma station now. Uh, this is a 23-year-old uh, gentleman. He was, uh, he met with a high-speed uh, collision accident, and uh, he's been brought by a &E to ambulance. ATLS has been done, and uh, you are the consultant on call, and uh, you're seeing this. Uh, this is his x-ray. Can you tell me what you can see there? So this is the uh, AP radiograph of the pelvis of the mature uh, skeleton, skeleton showing there is a fracture dislocation of the left hip and uh, uh -huh. it seems to be the fragment possibly coming from the femoral head. I would like to check the other view and uh, see the full length view. Okay. And uh, yeah. What are the other Im injuries you are suspecting in this patient? So it's a high collision injury with a dislocation seems to be posterior. It may be a uh, direct impact uh, on the knee and uh, causing this dislocation. So I would like to see the full length and it may be injury to the knee. And, and it's a high speed. So it's a, it may be a polytrauma. So I would like to approach this patient as ATLS uh, protocol. Yeah, ATLS has been done. Uh, but what other x-rays you would request? So full length uh, femur, mm -hmm. AP and lateral, and examine his uh, entire limb and also check the other limb as well, if it is direct dashboard injury. Okay. How, how will you proceed with uh, your examination and management? So uh, as you mentioned, uh, having said that... Uh, the there is no femur fracture, there is no knee dislocation or injury around the knee. How would you proceed with examination and management? So my examination would be to... Uh, once resuscitated, stable, look for skin, any open or closed injury or any abrasion. And yeah, then this, uh, uh, patient is stable, neurovax, uh, sorry, patient is stable, ATLS is done. Uh, this is the isolated injury on x ray, other uh, chest injury, other injuries have been ruled out. Yeah, I would like to check the his uh, neuroscopy status, particularly the sciatic nerve mm -hmm. function by okay. asking to dorsiflexion and sensation. Okay. And uh, this is the uh, Emergent, emergent condition to uh, relieve the pressure on the neuroscular bundle, also yeah. cartilage injury and also dislocation. I would like to... We can't, uh, there is a the sciatic nerve, is there is a palsy of sciatic nerve and uh, he's in agony, he's in a lot of pain uh, in the distribution of sciatic nerve. How would you manage? So I would uh, like to uh, know the fasting status. Uh, I'll uh, check he's, whether... He's, he's fasting. So I'll... Uh, in this scenario, because of the associated fracture, I would like to do this reduction as soon as possible in theater and fully anesthetized and a relaxed patient. So I will. Will you, will you try in a &E or will you take him to theater? Uh, because of the sciatic nerve injury as well as the fracture fragment uh, displaced, I would like to do it in fully anesthetized, relaxed patient okay. because of the severity of the injury. And also, I can simultaneously check my reduction and stability in the theater uh, there is a are you a, you are you are not a hip consultant you, you are uh, a, a hand specialist will you do it on yourself or do you seek any help from anybody so uh, 
if if a patient is coming then uh, yes i will discuss with my hip consultant uh, however uh, you are the consultant like, yeah. yeah so like to investigate uh, means furthermore to check the configuration how, what we how will you consent the patient CT. what will tell the patient so, yeah, i'll i'll consent the patient explain that he has got a very nasty fracture dislocation mm-hmm. which possibly may be a femoral head all the posterior wall fracture so the outcome with that it's not very good however what's the what's the title of your procedure for consent to consent the close reduction Mm-hmm. plus uh, minus open reduction through the posterior approach and explain to the patient uh, the apart from the routine risk risk of uh, damage to the nerve okay and uh, have you done any open reduction of uh, hip, dis- hip dislocations fracture dislocation yourself N- no i have not i have not done okay okay yeah uh, there is a hip consultant to stand by and he is happy for you to take him to the patient to theater what will you do in theater so uh, under x ray after giving anti uh, sorry uh, under x ray i would like in a supine position i would like to pull and uh, uh, in a is any technique name of the technique, technique uh, flexed the hip adduct and internally rotate and pull it which is the uh, vislo method and check whether it's a reducing or not and okay. if it is reduced then check the stability and the fragment uh, assess the fragment okay uh, yeah it's uh, not successful it's not reducing what you will do so in that scenario uh, i will uh, request my hip colleague to step in and uh, uh, assist me so or you should or have asked to... that before yeah. okay and you are successful it's back in place uh, what you will do so i'll check the where, where the fragment is lying make sure it's not in the joint and i will keep in the traction get an ct scan further if it is close reduction achieved then that is further management it's over now okay. five minutes over feedback time uh, feedback. Hi, uh, hi what do you think how, how did it go how did you do yeah i uh, i should have asked for the hip uh, surgeon especially being a complicated the fracture and dislocation if it doesn't come close then for open reduction uh, by the experienced rather than the even consultant is there anything you could have done better from beginning if i if you knew the question in advance and yeah. so think about it so if uh, that is then yes in any after any assessment uh, discuss uh, uh, with the uh, hip consultant they take their opinion yeah starting and, uh, starting you repeated the skeletally mature patient x ray i have told you age of the patient there was no yeah. need for that sorry mature yeah okay yeah sorry. i told you 23 year old patient yeah. and second you repeated atls i told you atls has been done uh that's a bit of it gives impression that examiner that you are not uh, exposed to the type of these type of cases then you should have told this in emergency because there is a neuro neurology injury and uh, acute pain this is a emergency case so you should have stressed the importance of the case and they want they want you should have demonstrated that you are safe surgeon you should seek the help of uh, your colleagues not to yourself take the data uh right you did the right thing by telling you take to take to take the patient to theater uh it's unlikely a few people may have try in any but you, you there is there is it's not wrong that you will say you will take it to theater uh, that's a good thing uh then the scenarios if you close reduce uh, visualos technique you mentioned uh then another scenario is sciatic nerve is intact but you reduced after reduction sciatic nerve is gone what you will do there are various scenarios which can lead after uh, your procedure and what is the definitive management you you rightly told you would get a ct scan post op, post operation you didn't mention pre operatively if you have time you should get a ct scan if you done quickly but don't waste time in pre operative ct scan if it's adjacent to any you can get it done but post operatively you should get a ct scan yeah then they will uh, they don't ask they won't ask you about pekin classification but you can voluntarily mention it that will like uh, demonstrate that you are aware of these fractures yeah and involvement of hip surgeon again for definitive management and uh, approaches they can ask you which approach you will do you rightly mentioned post hip approach yeah you, you can get six but if you have done from the beginning you have given me impression that you you are safe surgeon you could have got seven if you are told about any evidences or reached the prognosis you could have got eight yeah yeah thank you
Thank you. That's brilliant. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Shitan. Very good question, uh, trauma question, um, relevant um, to the theme today. So I would like um, to thank uh, today um, everyone who attended from faculty from the Orthopedic Academy, uh, Nicola, uh, Shitan, uh, Shwan, and I'd like to thank above all uh, Khaled Al Awadi, uh, who is led the session today and covered a wide range of pediatric upper limb trauma cases, which are specific for the FRCS exam. And he's promised he will do another session for the lower limb, uh, pediatric lower limb, which we will advertise on the webinar section on the Orthopedic Academy website. Uh, so please, guys, visit there and try to register when you can. And uh, I would like to thank um, everyone who attended today. Um, um, and we also thank uh, Ortho TV uh, team and uh, Dr. Ashok Shyam for uh, collaborating with us to spread the word and um, inform you know, Ortho TV viewers of our activities so they can attend and benefit. Um, also, final a reminder, if anyone is interested in attending any of our courses, uh, please visit uh, orthopedicacademy.co.uk. Um, we have the case-based discussion course um, and the mock exam course courses uh, available. Um, so please try to book as soon as you can if interested. So thank you very much, everyone, and um, we, good night. Good night, bye. May I ask the faculty to just stay behind, please?